Kids in the thick, often in urban poor communities. The access to guns, one of the reasons the United States stands out compared to other industrialized countries. We know alcohol and other drug use represents a risk factor. Witnessing and being victimized, one of the more robust, and I'll just tell you about the Boston Youth Survey findings, which shocked our community. Basically, we knew from the children's, um, the Boston Medical Center Pediatric Center survey that about 10% of the kids by the age of six had witnessed a gunshot wound or a stab wound. But what we didn't appreciate in the high school survey was that the number of children on, at high school level reporting exposure to violence, severe and not so severe, was almost 90%. And when you tease it out to look at the more severe episodes of violence, that number was almost half of the students. At many points, this witnessing violence and victimization and the fear that's up under there uh, turns out to be uh, a risk factor. I put biological uh, abnormalities up here. There's some interesting studies about neurotransmitters like serotonin, for instance. And I want to say that just because there's a neurotransmitter that is associated with violence, that does not mean there is a genetic predisposition to it. You see, it may be that if a woman is batter doing, uh, during gestation while she is pregnant, there may be some interference with the body's ability to make serotonin or the receptors for serotonin. We don't know this, but you know, everything boils down to some neurotransmitters. When you fall in love, there are a few that go up and some that go down, and you know, it's, it's just the you know, biochemistry of the, the brain. And then there's the culture of violence, and we're gonna talk about that, because I started thinking about that as a problem, and now I'm pretty sure that's a large part of our problem. These risk factors are, operate at all of these levels, individual, family, community, society. The interesting thing is that resiliency factors operate at all these levels as well. And as a community, as a city, you may not have a lot of control over the risk factors for any given child or family. But you do have control, more control, over the resiliency factors. And it is that balance of risk and resiliency that seems to matter. So as you think about what Cincinnati can do, what the citizenry here can do for your children, think about the assets that they need, the resiliency factors that can help with this problem. When you saw that uh, red bar and then that purple bar, uh, you saw the first wave of the epidemic of youth violence. Uh, it was almost all urban America, almost all cities of greater than 500,000, almost all young men, and for the most part, young men of color in urban poor communities. That was what that purple bar was, and we call that the first wave. The second wave, probably um, epitomized best by the, the Columbine shooting in uh, Littleton, Colorado, is that violence that is occurring in small town, middle class America. And in many ways, um, it caused us to shift our thinking a little bit. Uh, in the first wave, we wanted to get these demons and these super predators away from us. And so in schools, we got police and we got tougher sentences. When we got in the second wave, we got a little more empathetic. Now, shame on us for not responding differently in that first wave. In the second wave, we got interested in school psychologists and we wanted to know about bullying and we wanted to understand what could happen to a child that would cause him or her to behave so violently. That's progress. 
but you're still focusing on that individual. And we're missing James Garbarino's work, The Socially Toxic Environment. And I think the third wave, which has to do with what girls are doing uh, now, will force us as a society to appreciate that it matters what we say to our children. It matters what we admire and what we teach them to admire. And before moving to talk some more about the third wave, I want to highlight that while not showing up in the data quite yet, um, there is likely a fourth wave out there. We're hearing anecdotally about younger and younger uh, children becoming involved in violence. Let's explore what's happening to girls. And this is the decade of the 90s. It's been repeated uh, in uh, the date, uh, in, since 2000 to date. And that is this increase in girls and uh, their arrest for violence. In the 90s, what was very interesting is most of that increase for girls paralleled a decrease in arrest for boys. Now, I want to make it clear, boys are still responsible for most of the violence and the most severe violence. So their rates were up here and went down a little bit. Girls' rates were down here and went up a bit. Nevertheless, I think when we look at what happened with girls, we really have to begin to make an assessment. We have to ask ourselves, why? Why are the rates for girls coming up? And in many ways, this is for me yet another piece of evidence that we're dealing with a preventable problem. So this is a magazine article that I came across. You saw the cover of the magazine. It's a magazine for teenage and young adult girls. And uh, you can read the title of this article. It turned out it really wasn't an article. It was a clothing spread. Up under the um, title, it says, Who Wants Cotton Candy Sweet All the Time? It's Nice to Show Your Mean Streak. And then up in the corner, it says, proud to have broken eight out of the Ten Commandments. So I don't know which eight, uh, but <laughs> by, the, by the time you get to eight, you are doing some illegal things. You know, that's pretty, yeah, that's pretty clear. Um, it goes on to tell you that her leather skirt is $340. And again, this turned out to be a, a clothing spread. The last time the girl above cried was the day she was born. It's good to be bad. And on the right is her demure look. Um, you won't find please and thank you in her vocabulary. This for me was probably the most frightening of all of those layouts because if you think about what people who know each other, who are in the same family, who are acquaintances, need in order to handle the emotions of life. Please, thank you, I'm sorry, excuse me. Those are fundamental. I find them necessary in my relationships. And that they are unpopular. Um, I didn't know please and thank you were that unpopular, but. It, you think that's, a, excuse me, is unpopular, and I'm sorry is really out of style, big time. Um, and I don't know how you get along with people if you can't apologize. I'm not perfect, and I don't expect anybody else around me to be perfect. And if I can't apologize and I can't accept an apology, I don't know how we get along. So we've got a cultural dimension to this problem that I'm convinced is more and more a part of it.